Robert H. Cargan is the Willis Shepherd Professor of the History of Science, a title he has held since 1979 at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. He received his PhD in history from Cornell University, in addition to an MS in physics from Yale University. His long range research focuses on the second industrial revolution and its consequences in all aspects of modern life. In addition to numerous journal articles and book chapters, he has published several book, uh, books, including the following. World's First on the Eve of War, Science, Technology, and Modernity from 1937 until uh, to, uh, 1942, Urban Modernity, Cities and Innovation in an Era of International Cultural Change, um, The Rise of Robert Millikan, A Life in American Science, Science in Victorian Manchester, Enterprise and Expertise, Atomism in England from Harriet to Newton. Well, thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. De Klerk and Professor Garipur for inviting me to participate in this fascinating uh, project. Um, I would like to talk this afternoon about what I believe to be an interesting comparison between the health crisis brought about by the early industrial revolution in England and today's COVID-19 pandemic. As most of you know, uh, the industrial revolution rested upon the production of cotton goods, employing power-driven machines, particularly the steam engine. It took place in a new system of production, which was known as the factory system. And it created new social classes, especially the working class or proletariat. It brought wealth and power uh, to the industrial middle class. And it was uh, associated with the rise of uh, associated industries, chemical industries of bleaching, dyeing, uh, new forms of transportation like the railroads uh, that used coal-fired steam engines. It took place above all in England in the city of Manchester in the north of England, and it ex which experienced a dramatic uh, growth in population. In the 1780s, uh, the Manchester region was a, basically a small market town of about 20,000 people. By the 1850s, it had grown, Greater Manchester had grown to a metropolis of over a million people. Yeah. And um, you can, it, this was accompanied by dramatic changes in the environment, as you can well expect. There was incredible air pollution, smoke, hydrogen sulfide gas, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. It had a noticeable river pollution from sewage and above all chemical wastes. There was even noticeable food contamination, which created a lot of interest at the time. And not surprisingly, all these factors led to a health crisis. Now, the Victorians loved statistics, and they were startled by the mortality statistics that were coming out and published around the 1850s. It showed huge disparities in life expectancies between Manchester and less industrialized areas of England, uh, like Rutlandshire. Uh, for example, uh, laborers in Manchester had an average age of death of 17, whereas in Rutlandshire, a much less industrialized area, uh, the average age of death was 38. There was a public outcry, and they turned to the medical community for analysis. Now, you have to remember that this was the pre-germ theory uh, period. Uh, the germ theory came later with the work of Pasteur and Koch. Uh, the prevailing medical theory at the time was the theory of miasmas. Oh, miasmas were more popularly known as bad air. And this was caused, they believed, by decaying organic matter. And they used the term disinfection 
as their goal. But this infection meant in those days, uh, it meant the prevention of miasmas. And for action to essentially meet these problems, uh, they turn to a new breed of experts. And these people were, began to be known as scientists. The term was invented in the 1830s and became popular at the end of the 1840s and 1850s to, uh, to, to denote a group of people who earn their living by systematic organized knowledge. Uh, the ones who were meant who, or who dealt with this health crisis uh, frontally were essentially German PhDs, uh, German trained PhDs. They were Englishmen who went to Germany to get their doctorates. The PhD didn't exist in England until the 20th century. Um, and they were mainly students of the chemist, the famous chemist, Justus von Liebig in Gießen and uh, who had been training organic chemists in his laboratory from the 1820s on. Uh, the British guys who led this, uh, or, or were the centers of attention in the 1840s and 50s, or 50s and 60s, I should say, were people like, the names probably don't mean anything to you, but they were Lyon Playfair, Robert Angus Smith, and Edward Schunk. And the, these people were brought in to head commissions of inquiry that led to legislation, parliamentary acts, known as the Public Health Acts, and the creation of a, an entire public health bureaucracy. They served as expert witnesses in court cases. They became public spokesmen for environmental reform. And this led to the containment and improvement of the worst abuses of uh, public health and safety that they were experiencing at the time. But the biggest change was beyond this. It was the revolution in public attitudes towards science and expertise. It wasn't just that the nation turned to scientists to solve problems in a crisis, but rather they began to build science and expertise into the institutions that became central to public life. Institutions, for example, like universities and uh, who conducted research. And research was widely recognized for the first time as a public good. Teaching hospitals, uh, hospitals transformed themselves into teaching hospitals and it became natural for scientific experts to uh, appear before parliament and before the courts. Industry, for the first time, was expected to accept regulation. Unfettered capitalism, in principle at least, uh, was no longer unquestioned. This impacted urban life, as you can well expect. Before science intervened, urban, the city, particularly Manchester and many northern cities, was a, a, a slum-ridden, dangerous place. If you could afford it, you lived elsewhere. But after the intervention and the public confidence uh, that these Ill, the ills of urban life could be mastered by organized knowledge, um, the city was a place to be. Uh, it, you, you could look at this period in Manchester, for example, you see the founding of universities, libraries, the symphony, art galleries, museums. Uh, they were able to define urban life and the health crisis only served as a centralizing force. Now, um, turning to today's pandemic, we see some similarities and some very important differences. Presumably, in the intervening century and a half, um, uh, science and science-based technologies have been built into our economic system. And we naturally turn to medical experts for analysis and cure. Public confidence in experts rises, public health 
measures are introduced and they're tempered by drastic economic consequences and political considerations. In the United States, the situation is very complex and made complex uh, by a welter of competing sources of information. The cowboy mentality, for example, in the mask crisis, competed with public health restrictions. Uh, the, the mass crisis is still playing out, and we still have um, resistance uh, to the public health measures uh, that were um, uh, much less public and forceful in the 19th century. In all likelihood, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic will have drastic effects on urbanism. Uh, the 21st century public health crisis, as opposed to the 19th century one, is taking place in a very, in a vastly different social, economic, and technological context. I'm arguing uh, that this crisis will likely atomize the city rather than centralize it. The advance of communication technology had already put into play forces that decentralized urban life. Even before COVID-19, we were already witnessing empty suburban shopping malls, let alone downtown uh, department stores, uh, rise in, in the people working from home, office space vacancies. I mean, downtown no longer has had, uh, in the past decade, uh, a monopoly on, on business. Uh, the technologies of the 21st century have tended to undermine this traditional strengths of urbanity. In culture, for example, libraries, museums, symphony orchestras, and opera operas were under tremendous financial stress, uh, even before um, COVID-19. And uh, COVID-19 may be delivering a death blow. Uh, to many of these organizations. Manufacturing, we've already seen uh, the, uh, uh, the impact uh, of automation and uh, communication. Business offices, as I said before, uh, no longer, downtown doesn't ha have a monopoly anymore, and in fact is not even de desirable anymore. Uh, the re in real estate, we may be seeing the Los Angelization of American urban areas. Uh, that is, uh, for a long time, people were downsizing. They were moving to central cities for the cultural life, for the, for the uh, vivacity of urbanism. And now we're beginning to see, but even before the COVID-19, we were beginning to see some uh, movement toward uh, sort of hung, bunkering, bunking at home uh, or home as a bunker. Uh, now, I think COVID-19 has reinforced that. Uh, COVID-19 is a centrifugal force, accelerating these trends dramatically. And even after a vaccine is found, and I think, uh, and we all hope that it will be found and widely distributed and effective, uh, even after that, I think some of the impact, uh, some of the drama, of COVID-19 will remain. And it will, uh, there will be some bounce back of, of urbanity, uh, but I think it won't be, uh, it, will, it won't reach its old form at, for a long time, if ever. And I think the, the trends of that technology had been initiating will continue uh, into the, well into the 21st century. Thank you.